All right. Well, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to see you all here. Um, I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Michael Gillette. Um, he's going to talk to us today about medical ethics, um, especially in the time of COVID and sort of pandemic considerations. Um, Dr. Gillette is a medical ethicist uh, who lives in Virginia, um, but you know, medical ethics are not necessarily state dependent. So we are happy to have him here chatting with us today and I'll let you take it away. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's good to see all of you. Um, so before we get started, a couple of, uh, let me say a few words of introduction. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself, and then I'll lay down some ground rules, and then we'll jump into things. But uh, as you heard, my name is Michael Gillette. I work in the field of clinical ethics. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about my work, um, I, uh, my PhD is actually in philosophy and clinical ethics. I uh, used to be a college professor, but uh, was doing a lot of consulting on the side while I was uh, busy teaching. And eventually my consulting business got so large, I needed to decide which way to go. And I decided to go full-time in the field of clinical ethics. So I um, have contracts with all different sorts of healthcare organizations, community hospitals, long-term care communities, hospice providers, physical therapy companies, just about every platform you could imagine where uh, healthcare is delivered. I have contracts to support their ethics programs. So that means doing ethics consults, helping with policy development and review, and doing a lot of educational work. Um, so the other part of my business is, of course, giving talks and lectures and leading discussions at conventions and seminars around the country. So um, whatever area of nursing you're likely to go into, um, I probably work with an organization that, that, um, that with which you would be familiar. So um, I feel free to share any ideas or thoughts you have uh, from your own perspectives as we get into this conversation. Um, I do want, we do not have a huge group. We've got about, well, 11 people plus me on here. So this is not a large group, which means we can be very informal. Um, do not be shy about unmuting yourself and interrupting me, asking a question, making an argument. Uh, as I told you, my degree is actually in philosophy, which means I am a professional arguer. Uh, my job is to disagree with whatever you say. Your job is to disagree back. And uh, we can explore the strengths and weaknesses of different uh, points of view um, through some good spirited debate. So we're not gonna argue with each other in a nasty personal way, uh, but don't be alarmed if I challenge your, your uh, point of view and you certainly will not offend me if you challenge back. So those are just the rules of the game. So I expect you to open your mouths and, uh, and to really argue uh, with me. Um, I do have some case studies that I wanna share with you, um, but I've put those towards the end of a PowerPoint that I'm about to share. Um, because I do think that before we get there, um, it might be helpful, and I'm sorry to be a little lectury up front, because I really do like the, the discussion, the, the argument, I do like that give and take, but I do think that it's worth um, sort of providing a little bit of, of conceptual background for the ethics of our pandemic response. And what I want to talk about today, when Maris got in touch with me and, and asked if I would give this talk, she thought that a couple of topics that might be of, of specific interest to you had to do with number one, how are we, or how did we and how should we triage and distribute scarce resources? Um, you know, in the early days, it was ventilators. That was the first big concern. Uh, it moved on to uh, therapeutics like, um, um, you know, uh, therapeutic plasma or whatever, whatever remdesivir, whatever was, was sort of hot at the moment. Um, and more recently, of course, it's had a lot to do with vaccine and vaccine distribution. So I am gonna talk a little bit about the allocation of resources. Uh, Maris also thought you'd be interested in talking a little bit about potentially some of the special ethical obligations that you have as providers uh, in terms of, of, number one, exposing yourself to risk. So do you have an obligation to put yourself in harm's way and to, ha and to what degree? And uh, things like vaccine mandates. Um, should you, do you have an ethical responsibility to accept a vaccine, especially one that's been um, put into production pretty quickly? And, and as, as of today, none of the vaccines that are available have anything more than an emergency use authorization. So I do wanna center on a couple of those themes. Um, and that's what I'm gonna sort of start off with. But then some of the case studies that I have 
are really more forward looking. I think the most interesting ethical issues that we have to worry about when it comes to this entire experience um, are still ahead of us. How are we gonna make very difficult decisions as we begin to reopen, as things are, they're never gonna go back to the way they were, but at least as we sort of regain a little bit of normalcy and we have to decide who gets access to what, how many people, do they have to be vaccinated? Um, you know, how do we distribute the opportunities that will slowly in a staged way uh, make up a part of our transition back to a pre-COVID standard of care. And I think there are gonna be a lot of fairness issues that get asked there. Um, some countries are already playing with the idea of green passports, uh, you know, that you can get to go to the movie theater, but only if you show me your vaccine certificate. Uh, is that fair? Is that appropriate? Um, we're gonna see that in long term. In fact, this morning, um, I had a session with a long-term care community where I'm under contract, and we spent our entire uh, session talking about um, the ethics of releasing restrictions on things like visitation and how you orchestrate that. We're getting words from residents in long-term care, for instance, who are saying, well, my friends and I are all vaccinated. And so we want to gather in the dining hall in a group of 10. And yet the rules say only four people, but we're all vaccinated. We all want to get together. But if they all get together, um, first of all, there, there could be restrictions that are on a state level, but if they all get together, it could affect the entire um, capacity of the dining room, which still might have a, a capacity restriction. So is it fair to other people to let a gar large group go in and eat up capacity, meaning other people have to eat back in their apartments? What do we do about those sorts of social issues? So there are all sorts of things we can talk about. I'm happy to ditch my PowerPoint and just go with whatever lights you up. If you've got a case or an issue or a question, we can certainly go there. But as I said, I think the first most important thing will be for me to give you a little bit of theoretical, or I should say conceptual background on this. So I'm sorry, it's gonna be a little lecture at first, but I do want you please to interrupt me at any point with questions, comments, concerns, agreements, disagreements, whatever. Now, when I share my screen, Maris, I'm not easily gonna see the chat box. So if you could monitor that, and if someone who's too shy to unmute themselves types in a question, um, then I'm, I'm trusting you to interrupt me yourself and, and tell me there's a hot issue we need to discuss. Um, oh, I, and, and now I see that I, my screen sharing is disabled. So you need to, you need to give it me- It does this every time. Hang on one second. All right, try it now. There we go. Thank you for giving me permission. So I put a lot in here and we probably won't get through all of it, but can I see a thumbs up to let me know that you can see my PowerPoint? Beautiful. So this is the year in review, although what I said is that I also really wanna look at what's coming at us. Um, but in order to understand this ethical context, I wanna introduce you to a philosophical term. It's a word or a couple of words that you probably use in normal language, but there's a, there's a pretty precise philosophical definition of this. And, it's, and you'll see in a moment while it's important, why it's important. The, the term that I want to introduce is this concept of a moral dilemma. Now, now, people talk about moral dilemmas all the time and they say, oh, you know, I have a, a really tough decision. I don't know what to do. It feels like such a moral dilemma. Um, so, so people have a tendency to say moral dilemma when what they really just mean is a difficult choice, sort of I'm, I'm, I feel like whatever I do, I'm going to be unhappy. I, you know, there's tension, there's moral tension here. But for, for a more precise use of the term, if you, if you really wanna speak more like a, like a philosopher, you have to recognize that a moral dilemma is a very specific thing. A moral dilemma is defined as a situation where you are simultaneously subjected to two or more contradictory ethical obligations. Now, now, I want to just be clear about something here. An obligation, okay, is something that you have to do. You must do. A, a, a prohibition is something that you may not do. Interestingly, I ask a lot of groups, so do you know what a prohibition is? They all say, yeah, they all say, yeah you may not do it. So I ask, well, so what's the opposite of a prohibition? And invariably, the majority are, um, will answer by saying, well, if a prohibition means that you may not, then the opposite of that 
means you may. That's wrong. Um, permissibility, which means you may, you don't have to, but you can if you want to, is actually right in between a prohibition, which is must not, and an obligation, which is must. And a moral dilemma is defined as a situation where you have multiple obligations, which means that if you fail to do them, you do something wrong. And yet it is impossible to satisfy both or as many as there are ethical obligations at the same time. If you do A, you automatically fail to do B. If you do B, you automatically fail to do A. And so therefore, no matter, and if you do neither, you fail in your obligations. You can't do both, which means no matter what you do, you will do something wrong. You failing to, to, to satisfy an obligation is in and of itself unethical, okay? So you have to understand that this concept of a moral dilemma means not just I'm feeling some tension, I'm sort of uncomfortable, but whatever I choose, I will do something wrong. There's no way out. Now, I just wanna tell you briefly, I don't wanna get deep into this because you're nursing students, not philosophy students, but there are many philosophers who deny that moral dilemmas even exist because they'll argue that if there are two obligations, then one of them usually has greater force than the other. So one of them can sort of cancel out or override the other one. And if they're equal, well, then you have an obligation to do something, you could flip a coin, but it's not really a dilemma because there's always a way out. Now, I don't wanna get into a big debate as to whether moral dilemmas exist or don't exist. I wanna use this, this concept of a moral dilemma to just introduce you to the idea of disaster ethics. What is a disaster? What does it mean to be in a disaster situation? And what will the ethics be that attach to a disaster? And again, I'm gonna say, we say disaster in normal language far too easily. Um, because you know, we'll just say, oh, I was trying to um, bake a cake and it was a disaster. Okay, that's not a disaster, right? That's a screwed up cake, ain't no disaster. I would like to argue that a disaster in ethical terms should be used to indicate a situation where we find ourselves in a moral dilemma. Or at least if you don't believe in moral dilemmas, very, very serious moral binds. In other words, we find ourselves in a situation where we actually feel that no matter what we do, we're gonna do something wrong. When we look back on this a year later, two years later, however far in the future it is, we're gonna wonder if we're good people. We're gonna, we're gonna regret the choices that we made. And yet, the context, the environment would have been such that you couldn't have avoided doing something that you would later regret. That's how this concept of moral dilemma and disasters come together. So I would argue that from, from an ethical perspective, true disasters should be understood as situations in which we feel even, even if you don't believe they truly exist, we are certainly as close as we can ever get to being in a moral dilemma. Now, why, why am I spending any time on this? Let's just talk about ventilators, okay? Early on, the first policy I was asked to help write uh, for one of the hospitals where I'm under contract, the first policy I was asked to really work on when we hit this pandemic, was a ventilator triage policy. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little while. Um, we'll get into that in a little more detail, but it is often perceived as an allocation of scarce resources issue. You have, you have three patients, you only have one vent because you know, the ICUs are full and we've got all these people in respiratory distress. And so you, get, you, you used up all your vents and you got this, this slew of patients coming in. And so you got three new patients now in respiratory uh, distress and they all need to be intubated. And yet all the ventilators um, are full, but then one ventilator becomes available. And the question is gonna be, which of the three 
should get the next event. Now that's a pretty standard allocation of resources issue. And quite honestly, we've dealt with it for decades. We've always had situations where you have one kidney available, you got three patients who need a transplant, which patient should get the next kidney? All right, it's tough, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, but from an ethical perspective, we've dealt with that. It seems pretty straightforward. That is sad, but it's not a disaster. We're, we're comfortable knowing what we ought to do there, all right? And yet, at the beginning of this pandemic, when we were really worried about what was going to happen with, uh, with our resources, in this case, ventilators, I was asked to write a policy that didn't just ask if you have multiple patients all in need of ventilator support and you have a limited supply of ventilators, who should get the next vent? No, no, no. I was asked to write a policy that contemplated the possibility that we would extubate one patient in order to liberate the resource to reallocate to another patient. Now we don't ever, ever do that. We, we never, we, we know we got three patients and one kidney, who gets the next kidney? But we never suggest that what we ought to do is rip a kidney out of a patient from someone who's actually using it and you know benefiting from it, that we should forcibly remove your kidney from you in order to give it to a patient who, who could use it better than you as a, like, a higher likelihood of survival. And yet that's precisely what we were being asked to contemplate at the beginning of this pandemic. Would it be ethical and under what conditions and following which guidelines would it be ethical to, without consent, forcibly extubate one patient in order to reallocate a ventilator to another patient? Now that's brand new. And that's as close as we get to a moral dilemma as you can imagine. Standing by and doing nothing does not feel right when you have someone already using a resource who has a very high likelihood of dying and someone else presents who could survive if they got the vent. Standing around and saying, oh, sorry, man, but we're out of vents doesn't feel particularly right. On the other hand, making the choice to effectively kill someone in order to utilize resources in order to save others well, that doesn't feel right either. And yet that's the policy we had to come up with. That indicates we're in a disaster scenario. That indicates that our moral intuitions are being stretched to the limit. And that's what we have faced over the past year. And, and I'm gonna go over some of this in a moment. We have, we've, we've faced it repetitively in different areas um, as we've gone. So, I'm gonna keep going unless anyone has a question, comment, or argument. And just say that in the face of all that, um, and, and by the way, let me tell you this, the slide I'm about to show you, I wrote in 2008. I was asked in 2007 by one of the hospitals where I work to help develop a policy on disaster preparedness, believe it or not, thinking about pandemics. We had already seen SARS, we already knew about MERS, and people were thinking, gee, we gotta, we gotta get ready. Anyone who tells you we couldn't have seen this coming, anyone who tells you that, oh, you know, who would have predicted, there's no way we could have known, they are either extraordinarily ignorant or they are flat out lying to you. In 2008, I was already working on pandemic preparedness from an ethical perspective. And yet that material laid there doing nothing um, for 12 years until we got hit with this. So we should have seen this coming. We should have been able to prepare better and we didn't. So what did we think back in 2008 when we talked about this? Well, recognizing that we're facing a disaster and we're gonna to have to make some very, very difficult choices and not just difficult, but the kinds of choices that push us outside of our normal uh, ethical attitudes, that's the de definition of a disaster. Um, I would argue that there are five categories of ethical issues for you to consider. And they sort of fall into groups. So the first two um, are one set of group, is one set. The second two is another set. And then the, the fifth one is, uh, is on its own, um, is in its own category. So the first one is allocation. This is the very, very first thing that everybody thinks about when they think about 
uh, pandemics or, or other sorts, even natural disasters. We, when hurricanes hit, we have to make similar decisions. So how are we gonna triage resources, ventilators, remdesivir, vaccines, et cetera? Um, this is all very patient or population centered. If we run out of beds, who gets, right? How are we gonna decide how to manage issues when a lot of people are in need? Those are allocation issues. And it's the first thing everyone thinks about, but those are very outward facing. They are patient centered, population centered. You can ask the same kinds of questions, but reverse the focus, turn it inward and look at providers. I call this fairness. I really should say fairness type one are allocation issues and they're sort of population oriented. Fairness type two, staff oriented issues, you oriented issues. How do we triage staff? How do we distribute risk among staff members? I don't know if it's one of the cases that I put in um, in my PowerPoint for later. I think maybe it's not, but I, one of the early ethics consults I got was because nurses, sorry guys, I'm picking on you now, nurses in one of the hospitals where I work, it actually was a mental health facility, so an inpatient mental health um, institute. They were very upset that the psychologists got to do telehealth work from their offices to do psych evals. Meanwhile, the nurses had to be in the room with the patients doing close care and they were being exposed to contagion. And some of the nurses actually said, it's not fair that we have to go into the patient's room while the psychologists get to sit in their cushy offices or even better are working from home. So they wanted to argue what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we have to come in and see a patient face to face, everybody has to come in and see a patient face to face. I'd like to hear what you all think about that. Um, but that was the argument and that was an early ethics consult that I got. It has to do with how you distribute risk across staff members. And it's not even just, gee, do nurses have to take more risks than psychologists? But let's think about it another way. Suppose, um, who's there? Amira, uh, you are a nurse. You are assigned a task um, in a high risk environment, you are doing respiratory therapy where you're intubating people in there's and there's spittle just flying all over, aerosolized yuck is all over the place, or you're doing ED work where you are screening people when they come through the door. Um, and you do that for a shift. Now the question, now the question is going to be, well, Amira's done her fair share. Should we send Erica in next? I mean, Amira already spent eight hours being exposed to all the yuck that's out there. It's only fair that Erica should now uh, have to staff the ED for the next shift. Well, on the one hand, it seems fair that you should distribute risk. If we send Amira back in, if Amira is the only one who has to do that work, we protect Erica, right? But the odds that Amira is gonna get exposed go through the roof. Well, that's not fair. So Amira, you should do your fair share and then get out of the way and Erica, you move in next. But Erica is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you spreading risk across all of the staff members? At some point, Amira is gonna die and you're gonna need another nurse to go in and take her place. If you get me sick now, I won't be there. So let's just concentrate the risk on Amira, wait till she drops, and then we'll worry about who comes in behind her. That would be far more efficient. Why do you want to expose everybody to contagion rather than limiting it to a particular set of personnel um, so that we can maintain other personnel to do less risky things and not spread infection all throughout the hospital? So this is fairness type two. Is it, is it ethical to distribute the risk evenly or should we concentrate the risk in order to be more efficient? There are another, other questions as well there, but let's move on. Liberty questions. Liberty type one, also outward facing, patient centered, population centered. When is it ethical to quarantine people, to place people in isolation, to require masks, to, to close businesses, right? We're now facing new issues. When is it ethical to allow people to go back to their old ways of doing things, for group activities and long-term care to resume? Um, for visitation to begin in intellectual disabilities group homes. So there are freedom issues. That's what liberty issues are. One version, outward facing, patient centered. When is it ethically justified to limit people's freedoms? Number four, 
same sorts of questions, but again, turn the focus towards staff. Liberty type two, all of the freedom questions, but now looking at staff members. Do you have an ethical obligation to stay on post even when it is very, very dangerous? If we are running short on staff, can I ask you to practice outside of your area of expertise, to do things that you don't feel you're trained for? For, your new, for you nursing students, you know, there were states that were getting to the point where they were saying, we are going to rush licensure. You don't even have to sit for your exams because we need to get people out there now, right? In med school, there's the old adage of um, see one, do one, teach one, right? So let me show you how to do a, a vaccine, you know, an inoculation. Let me watch you do one. Now you go find five people, teach them, and we're all, we're going to get up and running in this vaccine center. Do you have a right as a staff person to say, hey, I didn't sign on for this. I'm out of here. Or do you have an ethical obligation because of the role that you play, because you've agreed to become um, a, a member of a helping profession, that actually you have an ethical obligation to show up? And even when you're at risk, you have an ethical obligation to stay on post. And if I ask you to do something you're uncomfortable doing, your duty is to learn it. Um, we could push this further. Do you have an ethical obligation to get vaccinated? Can I mandate that for you? Um, it, can, it, can it be a legitimate employment expectation? And then finally, number five, um, public coordination. I'm not gonna say too much about this uh, because I could go on forever and I don't want to, but this is where we screwed up big time as a nation. Um, back in 2008, when I wrote this slide, I almost didn't include public coordination. And then at first I put it lower down on the slide because I thought to myself, you know, it's an interesting issue, but it's really pretty mechanical. It's pretty administrative. It's not really an ethical issue. It's just a, it's just a pragmatic, how do you get things done question. So maybe it's not ethics. Maybe it's just, you know, administrative expertise. Uh, I am very confident after this uh, experience that this is an ethical issue and it belongs on the list with the others. From the federal level to the state level, to the regional level, to the, even the local level, we did a horrendous job of defining standards of care, of explaining how those standards of care would be applied, of trying to figure out how different organizations, which could be individual hospitals or departments or states should be working together. Who's in charge? What's the chain of command? What's my role versus your role? I don't know if it's the superintendent of schools who decides whether or not you can take over the high school gym as a vaccine center, or if it's the chief of police, or if it's the CEO of the local hospital, or if it's the city manager, um, because no one's figuring it out. And from the federal level on down, we were getting mixed messages, uh, and, it, it, and it's clear, it's clear that many, many, many people are, are now dead who didn't have to be because we did not have consistent messaging. And I'm not making this a political argument, one side versus the other, because this was a failure on every level of government, um, from the federal level to the local level. Um, and, and I think there's an ethical obligation to determine what our roles are, to figure out how to satisfy um, what's expected of us, and to maintain uh, a consistent and appropriate chain of command. And that actually leads me to um, the last couple of slides I want to I want to share with you before I start asking some questions um, and, and opening it up for a little more discussion. Chain of command, roles, okay? Let's be clear about a few things. So now I'm starting to even answer some of the questions that I haven't quite asked yet. Some roles do require reasonable levels of sacrifice, okay? So police officers have to fight crime, even if that's a little dangerous. Firefighters have to fight fires, even if that's dangerous. Home health care workers have to put up with all kinds of, of disgusting things when they provide um, health care in people's homes. I have, I have heard from home health uh, nurses who have told me about the bed bug infestation they brought home from work and, and all the rest of it. Listen, there are certain jobs that require um, or maintain reasonable expectations for sacrifice. 
And it's not just these. I mean, teachers have to do things that non-teachers don't have to do, right? I mean, they're, even forget professions. Parents have to make sacrifices for their kids um, because that's what it means to be a good parent. So when you take on a role, there are reasonable expectations for how you will place the welfare of others in the center of your thinking. Let's just be clear, being a nurse carries with it a set of ethical obligations that non-nurses don't have to worry about, okay? And it's not unique to nursing. It's gonna be true of everybody. In fact, just being a friend sets you up as having a role where you expect one thing from your friends that you don't expect from others. So sacrifice is out there as a necessary condition for satisfying your ethical obligations. At the same time, there are clear limits to that level of responsibility. Police officers don't have to turn themselves into human shields. Firefighters don't have to run into collapsing buildings that if they know that it's gonna fall, they don't have to just lay down their lives. Um, home health care workers don't have to try to provide health care in the middle of, a, of an active drug deal with guns on the table. It's that is going too far. So one of the things we have to play with here is how far does your responsibility go? Um, if we're going to ask you as a nurse to take on certain responsibilities, even at the risk of your own health, then how far does that go? And third point, um, to what degree does your employer have to uh, try to make reasonable mitigating efforts? Um, police get bulletproof vests, firefighters get fireproof suits, healthcare workers should get PPE. So with those sort of analogies in mind, I wanna just, I'm almost done with the intro here, stick with me introduce you to this Greek word. It's, an, it's a classical Greek word, arete. And arete, which comes from Aristotle and his, and his theory of ethics, basically says exactly what I just told you. That if I want to know what your moral obligations are, I need to know the story of your life. I need to know what roles you play, because roles carry with them expectations for behavior. If I'm a parent, I'm expected to care for my child. I never signed a daddy contract. I have two daughters. I do. And guess what? I never signed a daddy contract that said I was going to do anything. But if I don't feed my kid, when the police show up at the house and they want to bring me in because my child just died of malnutrition, it does me no good to say, show me where I promised to feed the thing. I never promised I feed the thing. Sorry, I don't have to make that promise. Built into the role of being a parent is that expectation, right? I gotta tell you, not to get too personal, but if you look at the videotape, and I'm old enough that it actually is a videotape of my wedding, nowhere in my wedding vows do I actually say, I will forsake all others never made that. I, it was not part of my vows. It wasn't there. If I have an affair with someone else, is my wife going to be angry? Yes. And should she be? Yes. And it will be absolutely no defense for me to say, well, I never promised. Sorry, guys. Built into the role. Unless we have some special understanding otherwise. Built in. Same thing with any role you play. There will be unwritten, tacit expectations for your behavior. Likewise, I can forge relationships. Maris called me up and said, hey, Mike, haven't you know, heard from you in a while. Or would you be willing to give a lecture to some nursing students? I said, yes, I'll see you at 3.30, right? On the 9th, today's the 19th, on the 19th. Um, if I didn't show up at 3.30, Maris would have every right in the world to be really angry with me. Now, there's nothing in my role that says I have to give a talk for the Ohio nursing students organization, but I promised I would. I made a commitment. I forged a relationship that carried with it an explicit promise, and that gives me an ethical obligation. The point here is that your ethical obligations grow out of the roles you play and the relationships you forge. But that means 
if you have different roles and different relationships, you have different ethical obligations. One size does not fit all. And most importantly, the role you play is defined by your context. What I want to do is introduce you to the notion of disaster arete. Disaster arete sounds like a ballet move going wrong, but what it means is that what I can reasonably expect from you because it's built into your role, in the middle of a disaster is different than what I can reasonably expect from you in any other circumstance. That the context itself changes my expectations for your behavior. There's an altered standard of care. This is rule number one for the ethical response to pandemics. Invoke an altered standard of care. Typically, we would have done X, but in this environment, we can't. Now, that's going to be a real disaster for you if I continue to hold you accountable to an old standard of care that you cannot possibly satisfy in our current circumstances. And that's not fair to you to hold you accountable to something that you cannot do. Unreasonable. So we need to recognize that in many ways, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a disaster, the standard of care needs to change. And it did. Documentation expectations change. Confidentiality expectations. There were relaxations to HIPAA. We started using Zoom to do telehealth even before we knew that it was up to snuff. You know, in the old days, telehealth was like, oh my God, I don't know how we'll figure it out. How do we know if we have confidentiality? How do we know who's going to be on the other end? When we hit the pandemic, it was like, Good enough, we're going for it. Standard of care change. Provide a recipient contact. How many times do you have to see your patients? How close do you have to be? Do you have to be in the same room? Used to be you could not bill for a visit unless you were physically present with someone except under very extenuating circumstances. Now, we don't want you to be in a room with someone except for under extenuating circumstances. Com complete flip-flop of the standard of care. Supervision has changed. People working for their licensure used to have to be in the same building with their supervisors, not anymore. Many states relaxing the oversight requirements of physicians over PAs and NPs because they want to increase the physician extender role. Distribution of resources, we've talked about, we'll talk about it more. Admissions decisions, discharge decisions, freedom of movement, visitation, all of that changed and it should have. That is how you respond to a disaster by changing the standard of care. And in order for you to do that, you need, these are the cardinal rules now of the ethical response to a disaster. We need to communicate clearly about who has the authority to declare a disaster so that we know that an altered standard of care is being put in place. We need to communicate what that standard of care requires. So we need to tell staff, this is now what we expect from you. Forget what we expected before. Here are your new marching orders. Very important, we need to communicate to consumers, to patients, to individuals served that they can't expect from their providers what they used to. Don't expect to be seen within 10 minutes. Don't expect that you can have your elective procedure. We're changing the rules because we are now in a disaster. So don't expect what we will not deliver. And then we need to talk about how we're going to invoke collective responsibility, which is frankly where we did not do a particularly good job in this disaster. What do we owe one another? Um, should we all just be expected to wear masks because it is your patriotic duty to worry about your neighbor? Which, who's going to be in charge of um, inter-organizational response? How are we going to distribute vaccines if we don't have a national distribution scheme? That's how we're going to work together as a team. And then finally, and we're almost there, not quite, it could be a while, when the disaster is over, we need to specifically declare that so that we know when the old standard of care will snap back on. Just as it would be wrong for me to expect you to satisfy pre-pandemic standards of care during a disaster, it's also unfair for me to expect you to satisfy disaster standards of care once the disaster is over. So we need to know when the disaster is over so that we can revert to our typical standards of care. And that's not going to happen all at once. It's going to be staged. 
and some things will never go back to the way they were. Telehealth, for instance, is here to stay. Um, and so we need to know what the new standard of care will be. All right, that was my very long-winded introduction to sort of how to think ethically about dealing with the pandemic. Um, let me pause and see if anyone has any comments, questions, arguments, um, any, anything anyone wanna talk about. If not, I'll keep moving. So what about, what about the, uh, the nurses and the psychologists? What, what came of it? Good, so let's just talk about that for a little while. Um, so like I said, and I, I don't think I put it in my PowerPoint, otherwise I will go to it. What, what about that exact situation? I'll ask you for some response. Um, I'll ask the group. So the consult I got was exactly as I described. This was a mental health, an inpatient mental health setting. Um, some of the individuals there need pretty acute care. Now, I mean, if they really need physical care, they're gonna probably be shipped out to a hospital, but nevertheless, we have some pretty low functioning individuals who do require some close care. And we have some people who also came from a community hospital whose primary diagnosis is mental illness, but also have some other health issues that they need to deal with. So we might have to provide everything from medication management to, to ADL assistance to dialysis. So, so there's a range of things we have to do. And that requires close support from nurses and from other direct care service providers. The nurses explicitly said, this is, it's not fair that the psychologists get to sit in their offices and do telehealth, mental health evals, while we have to go in there and change bedpans. So um, we all have to come into work. Either we all get to work from home or no one gets to work from home. So what do you all think about that argument? Um, is that a legitimate argument or not? How, how should we respond to, to those individuals who are concerned about that? Carol, I'm, uh, or, uh, Carol, go ahead. I think the thought process makes sense. Like either we all have to, all or none, that type of thing makes sense. But I don't think it makes sense at all because the psychologist can do his job sitting behind a screen. I can't wipe a butt sitting behind a screen. Like that is the type of thing that like, I have to be face to face. I have to be in contact with that patient for. So I understand why they're upset, but I also, if we're talking about reducing the risk of spread, the psychologist has a job he can do behind a computer screen and we do not, unfortunately. And that's what we signed up for, I guess. So oh, excellent. So Carol, you've actually made two arguments here or actually had a, an argument with multiple steps. So let's just, let's get clear on the steps that you've provided because you did a beautiful job of doing it. The first most important, th well, it's not the first thing you said. It's the second thing you said, but it's the most important thing you said, okay? So the most important thing that you said was that in the middle of a pandemic, the overriding goal is to reduce infection as much as possible. In other words, you, you believe that the goal as a healthcare system is to try to save as many lives as we can and save quality. But it's not just lives. It's also the deleterious effects, the side effects of COVID-19, right? So we want to we wanna spare people pain, suffering, and death. All right. So Carol's position is, that is our collective responsibility as healthcare providers. That's true for psychologists, it's true for nurses, it's true for doctors, it's true for the case managers, it's true for all of us. That's the overriding goal. Now, Carol then runs with that and says, now, if that's the overriding goal, then what that means is anything you could do to reduce the risk of contagion, you should do in order to reduce the risk of contagion which now translates into the first point that you made, which is if you can get your job done remotely, which reduces exposure, then you ought to get your job done remotely. If you cannot do your job remotely, well, that's unfortunate for you, but it's not an ethical problem. Some jobs just require more risk than others. So, so Carol's argument is well-spoken. Good job, Carol. Our job is to reduce contagion. Therefore, do whatever you can do to reduce exposure, which means anyone who can work from home, and I shouldn't say home because a lot of this is happening in the office, but whoever can work remotely should work remotely. And it's not unfair to the people who cannot work remotely to require of them that they actually expose themselves to risk. 
Does everyone agree with Carol's argument? Is there anyone who disagrees can with I, Carol's argument? Can I, can I provide a slight counterpoint? Okay. Which is, if we, I have no, I have no problem with the argument, but I, if, if I can change the context slightly, there, you may have known of national reports of physicians in the hospital, not seeing their patients face to face, going to the, to the sliding glass doors of their COVID patients rooms and peeking in and letting the nurses go in to assess their patients. And my argument in that instance is sure, psychology is great to do from telehealth. I do psychology from home, right? I see a therapist every week from home and that's great because she doesn't need to put her hands on me to, to check my skin, to listen to my heart, those sorts of things. However, in the case of a physician who has a, an obligation to see their patient, to assess their patient for themselves in order to prescribe a course of treatment and has to do that in a hands-on capacity, I think that there then is no excuse for that position not to do the exact same thing as the nurse and enter that room putting themselves at risk. Psychology, sure, yeah, let's go for it. But when you're talking about treating a COVID patient and prescribing remdesivir or whatever you're doing, you have an obligation to go into that room. Okay, excellent, excellent. By the way, uh, let me, let me, let's just back up for a moment. I like your example of, gee, I see a counselor once a week and we're doing it by telehealth and it's working great. I, I will just point this out. And I think it helps your argument a little bit. Even when it comes to psychology or psychiatry, it may not be possible to do it by telehealth. So if you're in a situation where you have a good relationship with your counselor, you are stable, you, you know, you, you know, you're you're dealing with whatever issues you're dealing with, but you but 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 you have a good therapeutic alliance and we're not worried that you are at imminent risk of harm to self or others, blah, 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 then it you're right. It works perfectly well to do telehealth. But if you were um, acutely mentally ill in the middle of a psychotic break, and I, and I don't know you, and I don't have a history on you, and you're not stable on meds or whatever, it might even in a psychiatric environment require a much closer evaluation than can be performed on telehealth. So, so here the argument's going to be, and this gets back to Carol, so, so Carol's argument still is going to work, because her argument was whatever could be done remotely should be done remotely. But whatever necessarily needs to be done close up needs to be done close up, all right? So now Maris is sort of pushing the argument forward, but, but Maris, now I'm gonna argue back with you. Um, and this is good, we're gonna, we're gonna really examine all the nuances here. One thing that was also happening in hospitals was that normally, um, you know, the nurse would go in to check on the patient and look at all of the settings on the vent or, you know, the, the telemetry was by bedside. And in some of the ICUs, they just got longer extension cords and the telemetry units were coming out into the hallway. So I could actually check, you know, your, your O2 sats and all the rest of it without having to walk into the room and stand next to your bed in order to read the readings. I could bring that machinery out into the hallway and I could read some of that without having to go into the room. Well, if that is reasonable, then that, what that means is, if I don't have to go in, I shouldn't. Even nurses shouldn't. If nurses can read O2 sats from the hallway, they should read O2 sats from the hallway. Excellent. So now the doctor says, nurse, you gotta go in the room anyway, right? I mean, you're the one, you're the one doing the close care. You're the one changing the bandages. You're the one doing the, the you know, giving the injection. I'm a doctor, I don't give injections. I mean, I got news for you. If I need a shot, I don't want it from a doctor. I want it from a nurse. I want someone who like does that for a living and does it well, right? So the doctor says to you, um, you're already going in. While you're in there, check the pulse. Why do I have to go in and with my own hand check the pulse if you're already in there at risk? This is Amira and Erica. Amira has already been coughed on by 10 patients. Why should we send Erica in to get coughed on when a mirror's already been coughed on, let, let, let her continue to get coughed on. 
Uh, but I'm not, prescri I'm not, not prescribing. I'm not prescribing a course of treatment. You are as the physician and you are prescribing that course of treatment based on your assessment of the patient. This is the same sure. reason why I don't just document what the previous nurse said on shift, right? I'm going to check that. Yes, uh, the patient does have equal pulses bilaterally, you know, like that sort of thing is I need to legally cover myself and say, I did my assessment and th these were my findings, but a step further, now you're part of the interdisciplinary team, you can't make your prescribed course of treatment based on what somebody else says. Otherwise, what's the point of you existing in hospitals at oh, all? Oh, please, Which please, please, Maris, don't overstate your case. And by the way, everybody <laughs> should know, Maris and I know each other from when she was a, a, a little small child. child. So, so, <laughs> so we, we can argue and, and I know she won't get upset. Maris, don't, don't overstate your case. You are 100% correct that a doctor needs to do, say, to provide a prescription on the basis of the doctor's assessment. But where does it say that an assessment requires physical contact? How many times has a doctor called in a medical order based on a report that nursing gives over the phone? We, we, get, we get doctors calling in orders all the time because the nurse reports patient is, is uh, you know, respirations have gone up, um, blood pressure has changed, uh, urine output is not what it used to be. Uh, and the doctor will say, oh, well, based on your report, my assessment is we need to adjust the Lasix. We need to, you know, manage the anti But then, but then the physician comes the next day to see the patient, to verify that the patient is improving, worsening, or staying stable. That this isn't just a one time, whatever you said goes, and now I'm never going to see this patient again. The physician or, or the physician can say, but actually that doesn't sound right to me. And I'm going to come and assess before I do that. They can say that sounds in line with my, my expectations. I sure. Okay. I expect that this patient might have some more pain or whatever, but if, if I feel that it's out of line with my expectations, I'm going to come see the patient. And regardless, I should come and see that patient the following day anyway. Now, now hold on. Okay. Because now you nursing <laughs> student, right. Are dictating to licensed physician what the requirements are for the physician to make an assessment. Now, if you're right, great, but it's the doctor who decides what information the doctor has to have in order to make an appropriate assessment and whether or not that requires an in-person evaluation and whether or not even if it's in person, it requires touching the patient, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Maris, I've been arguing against you because that's the way this game is played, but I actually think your argument's gonna work but we need to get clear on what it is because it's not, it's not the argument that was being made in the consult. In other words, the nurses who called up and said, this isn't fair, right? That the psychologists get to stay in their office while I have to go in. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And, I, and if we all have to, if any of us have to come in, we all have to come in, right? That's, that's a fairness argument. That, that, and that, that is more like, how do you distribute risk? Is it fair that some people get to have low risk jobs and other people have high risk jobs? Maris, you're making a, 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 an importantly, but nuanced different argument. In order for your argument to work, it cannot be, that's not fair. It has to be something else. What I don't is, think that's, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that that was in line with that argument. It's a different argument. I know, I know it's a different argument. So what is the argument? What, why is it, is, now you've, you've given me half the argument, which is doctors need to uphold their standard of care and they'll lose their licenses if they, if they don't do X, Y, or Z. But frankly, that's the doctor's problem. So, so the doctor's going to lose his license because he's a shitty doctor. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. But, but um, you know, the doctor just doesn't do what, what the doctor should do. Then that's up to the medical licensing board. I think you have a better argument, a more immediate argument to make that doesn't require of you that you decide for the doctor what you think the doctor ought to do. What would the structure of that? I mean, I think you're right. I think you win. But we need, very, we need to be very clear on what the structure of that argument is. Can any, does anyone have an idea? Just a few word choice changes. It affects the patient care. 
Yeah, in that's in that's Ferris's argument is that the doctor's not doing a good quality job in patient care. That's I, I agree with you that who was that? Leonora? Yes. I agree with you, Leonora. I mean, personally, I actually agree with Maris's argument that it's an irresponsible physician who writes a bunch of orders without ever coming in to see the patient. But I got news for you. I've been doing this work for 30 years. I've been I've seen plenty of irresponsible doctors. And somehow they go on with their lives just fine. I've also seen plenty of phenomenally good doctors, but there, there are those who will be sloppy with their work. Leonora's argument is repeating Maris's, which is a doctor should do this as part of their standard of care. This is what they should do. That's a good argument, but it's really only an argument that another doctor can make because it's gonna be the, the MD standard of care that applies and that's gonna be defined as what a similarly situated physician would do in similar circumstances. I mean, you may know what that is and you may be right about it, but that is still sort of internal to, to how, the how about standard of care. How about it puts my license at risk if I'm asked to carry out things that I don't know that my doctor has seen. Excellent, excellent. The, the, yes, the, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I just said we have scope of practice. We have, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. We have state standards that we have to uphold. We have things that we are told we have to do. I mean, yes. is that what we're looking for? <laughs> I, yes, I think that I think that the, the, the real argument here, I'll, now Maris just gave it to us in, in, and Carol too, in pretty practical terms. You have a nursing license and you are required to uphold the standards of practice for your profession which means you should not be engaging in services that are not consistent with your role, okay? That is a very practical way to say this. Let me say it in a, in a more theoretical, ethical way. And, and Maris, I know this is what you're feeling and what you're thinking, so this is why I ultimately agree with your position. What you described was not a physician who relies on you in making an assessment, but a physician who uses you as a tool to avoid doing something that normally the physician would do. In other words, one of the things that's so offensive about that is that you are not actually being respected. Well, first of all, just as a human being, I'm using you as a tool so that I don't have to worry about you know, exposing myself. But even worse, I'm not respecting, or I shouldn't say worse, equally bad, I'm not respecting you as a nurse because I'm not respecting the fact that you have a distinct profession and a distinct role for mine. So I'm just treating you like an object. I'm just saying, well, if you could take the pulse, then why, why should I bother? I might as well just use you. It's, all, it's very disrespectful. It's very disrespectful for a physician to use you to do the physician's job, as opposed to relying on you as a member of an interdisciplinary team, because then we're back to the initial position, which is, look, if some members of the team can do their jobs without being placed at risk, then they should do their jobs without being placed at risk. But that doesn't mean that one person gets to take advantage of another person and have that second person do both of their jobs and being placed at risk while they're doing it. So the rub here would be whether or not the physician could actually satisfy a reasonable standard of care without doing it herself. And if the answer is yes, then it feels more like the psychologist who's in the office doing telehealth evals. And we'd have to say, there's nothing unethical about this. And nurses, if you're at greater risk, I'm sorry, but that's because of the job you have. If on the other hand, it's someone saying, I can use you to get my job done. Well, now I'm with Maris. That feels like an unethical disrespect for a distinct professional. Um, and I think there's an ethical problem there. So what we said in that ethics consult was, Carol, you, you hit it on the head perfectly. Our overriding goal 
in a pandemic is to reduce contagion as much as possible. Um, and therefore, it's appropriate to use any mechanisms that we can that consistent with the quality provision of healthcare um, can also reduce contagion. In fact, I went one step further. Um, I wrote that in the ethics note, but I went one step further. And I said, the, the nurses were complaining that they're not being respected as nurses if they have to take risks that others don't have to take. And I responded exactly as you all just did. But then I added, you really wanna show you care about nurses? Because part of this was, let's show solidarity. It's not fair to the nurses, right? So let's all just buck up and show solidarity. In fact, the medical director made that argument. Psychologists should go in because that's how they show that they care about nurses. And my response was, you really wanna show you care about nurses? Why are you parading extra people on and off the unit, exposing them to far more people who are now hopping from unit to unit to unit, potentially being vectors of contagion, you really want to show you respect nurses? Try to keep that unit as safe as it can possibly be, not just for the patients, but for the providers. So don't bring extra staff onto a unit if they don't need to be there. All you're doing there is placing the nurses at risk. You want to have a special nurse appreciation day and buy them free lunch? Go for it. But don't, don't expose them unnecessarily. So we argued, as Carol would, um, don't, no, it's not unfair. It's not unfair that nurses have to go in and psychologists don't, although we also argued like Maris, but if your job requires it, then you got to do it. And it's not fair for you to use other people. Now, now let's push this, let's push this discussion. I'm sorry, Maris, I'm going to skip like all the stuff that I prepared. So let's just skip over all this stuff about vaccines and ventilators and how we're gonna do all this. And let me show you two cases because it's right, it's, it's a great follow on to what we were just talking about. Client C has been feeling very good about how services have continued on a virtual basis since the pandemic made office visits impossible. Now that the state has begun to reduce restrictions on in-person gatherings, provider D would like to see client C in the office. Client C is reticent to expose himself to unnecessary contagion and wants to continue with the online platform. Provider D doesn't see a serious problem with this, but he's more comfortable with in-person sessions. While there's no immediate risk to client C, provider D wants very much to insist on seeing him in the office. So here you have a patient, well, you have a provider who says, all of this pandemic telehealth stuff has, was fine when we had no choice, but you know what? Things, infection rates are going down. Uh, a lot of people have been vaccinated. I, I really don't work well on a computer screen. I really would like to see you in the office. The client says, I'm just not comfortable with that yet. I, I, I'm being extra careful. Things are going fine the way they are. I just wanna to continue to see you online. Who gets to decide when it's time for the patient to come back into the office? And before you answer, I mean, and there are three possible answers here. Answer number one is the patient decides um, because the patient directs his or her own care. The second answer is the provider decides because the provider gets to decide what is clinically appropriate. The third possible answer is person who's most risk averse gets to decide. So if they're both not comfortable, then it shouldn't happen. Okay. Now, before you answer, let me show you a second case. It's the flip side of the first case. Client E believes that the coronavirus risk has been radically overblown and that politicians and newscasters have made much ado about nothing. Once the statewide restrictions were lifted, she immediately wanted to return to in-person counseling. Provider F takes care of a sick family member who is immunocompromised, and she desperately wants to keep her exposure to a minimum. Does the client have the right to demand that provider F see her in the office? So in the second case, it's the patient who says, this coronavirus stuff is a bunch of hooey and I wanna see you in the office. And it's the provider who says, I think we're doing fine as is. 
All right, first case, other way around. Provider wants to see you in the office. Patient says, I'm not ready for that yet. All right, how do we manage these cases? Amira. Um, so I kind of have an answer that could work for both, but probably not, but I'll just say it anyways, okay. um, is that the patient in the first scenario does have the right to feel that they're not comfortable to go into the office. And then the provider in the second scenario has the right to not feel the need to have patients back in, especially with um, caring for an immunocompromised uh, family member. So my answer to that or is like, solution and i say that loosely because i'm afraid of what the counter argument's about to be um <laughs> is okay. that it's like um you as a patient have a right to seek out a provider who can meet your needs and you as a provider can have a right to refer your clients to a provider who will meet their needs so if i'm a patient and i'm the one who's like oh coronavirus is fake whatever I don't want to, I don't want to keep doing this on the computer. I want to see you in person. The provider reserves the right to say, this is my office policy. Here's provider A, B, C, and D. Feel free to see if any of those people would be comfortable seeing you in, in person, or I know that they're practicing in person. And then the patient in the first case scenario who has a provider um, that's encouraging them to come and see them in person, they can say, can you please refer me to people who would still be comfortable doing telehealth. And I know that's kind of a loophole answer, but that's what I came up with. All right. So, so I, at first I thought what you were going to argue was that whoever is most risk averse gets to decide. So if the patient wants to stay online, then the provider should stay online with the patient. And in the second case, if the provider wants to stay online, then, um, then the patient can't force the issue and and the patient should agree to stay online. But then you softened, you, you, you backed off, you got, you got mushy on us. And, and you said, actually, what I really mean is that um, if they don't agree, we should transfer care to somebody else. Now, now, I just wanna be clear that transferring care to someone else, while that does make sense in, in certain circumstances, certainly extreme circumstances, the transition to a new provider by itself can be very disruptive in, in, in the provision of services, and it can cause distress and trauma to the patients. Um, so it's not just so easy to say, oh, if you don't like the way I think, then why don't you get yourself another provider? Or, you know, if I don't like you, then, then um, you, you know, I don't have to take you as my patient. Um, I, I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult than that. I mean, what if the, what if, all right, Amira, I'll give you a real example. Okay. okay? Here's a real example. Um, one of the places where I work in Virginia, we call them community services boards. Um, in Ohio, I do a lot of work in Ohio, by the way, you guys have mental health boards um, where community-based services um, get funding, you know, to provide services in the community for mental health issues, substance use disorders, et cetera. Well, I was working with one of these organizations and there was a mental health provider. A client comes in and says, well, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with some depression, dealing with some anxiety um, uh, and, and does sort of an intake. And as part of the intake, the question of course is, when did this start and is there a trigger and what are you feeling? And the client revealed, I, I was in a long-term relationship, it fell apart. Um, so I'm dealing with this whole disintegrating relationship and it's, and, and I'm, and, and I'm afraid, you know, I'm suffering from some serious depression here. I'm having some bad thoughts. I need some counseling. So the supervisor says, wonderful, you have good insight. We can help you. We actually have on staff someone who does a lot of work in this area, worked on relationship issues. We'll set you up with that person. So now the client is assigned to a provider. And they start to meet and they have a really good, first visit, talking about general issues. I think it was probably the second visit. When the, and remember, this is a public agency supported with public dollars. And the client reveals, like on the second or third visit, when they're talking about this failed relationship, which at least the client thinks was a trigger for some of this uh, emotional disturbance, um, the client reveals, yeah, it was the same sex. It was the same sex relationship. The mental health counselor is a very conservative 
um, Christian counselor who comes right out and says, I believe that homosexuality is a sin and I don't ever want to be in a position where I have to help anybody um, feel better about engaging in a lifestyle that frankly God hates. So I'm, I, and, and now the client, the, the counselor goes to the supervisor and says, I need this guy off my caseload, All right? I'm going to reject this person as my client. And furthermore, this is where it got really dicey. I demand from now on that I should never have to talk about um, same-sex relationships. I should never have to deal with abortions. I should never have to do any of that stuff. I need a straight only caseload. This is a mental health counselor saying, I need a straight only caseload. Okay, Amira says, you know what? If we don't see eye to eye, I'm a provider, you're a client. If we're uncomfortable with what we want from one another, then you know what? The answer is find yourself another provider. So according to Amira, this mental health counselor had every right in the world to say, um, I don't like oh. your lifestyle and therefore... Um, I get a straight only case look. I'm going to transfer you to somebody else. Uh, okay. No, because first no? of all, no, because that's a, you're, you're including in that scenario, you're including religion. And my understanding is that in the United States, we have quote unquote separation of church and state. You can't bring your own religious views into a professional practice where you might have a, like, like we're saying the moral dilemma between what your religion Oh, 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 I'm going to stop you right there, Amira. So what? now I come to you because I'm dealing with the emotional trauma um, that has been caused um, by the fact that I am feeling, you know, this is the way someone would talk. Um, I am a Christian and and I know that it's wrong to be gay, but I am I mean, attracted to men though. and I need to talk to you, my mental health counselor, about my religion now you and then what do you say i'm sorry we can't talk religion and mental health no. counseling separation of church and state not allowed to You're talk about religion. What I'm, no as a professional no if that's the patient's needs you can try to counsel them on that but you as a professional cannot bring your own bias to a patient case that's but what patients, so, pa so patients can bring religion into counseling but providers can't i just want to be clear that's your position well, that's because our job is to cater to the patient's needs and the complaints. If they're having something where they're feeling guilty, because that's actually a conflict that like people can have. Of course. That, that can lead to severe mental health issues. So that would be a risk for the patient to want to discuss it with them. That's your professional obligation to care for your patient with the risks that they prevent. But as a pay, as an individual, I can't say I believe in X, Y, and Z, and then convince you to believe in that, or to tell you that because I believe in that, that's how I'm going whoa, to treat Whoa, 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 whoa! Mental health counselor never, ever, ever said I need to convince you of the <laughs> fact that being in a gay relationship is wrong. What the counselor said was, quoting Amira, "If we're not comfortable with each other, then you should find another counselor." That that counselor never said to the client. <laughs> you should be a Christian and you need to go to reparative therapy because being gay is wrong. What that counselor said was, I don't want to have to deal with this because that would be a violation of my religion. The, the, I would say that the, um, the doctor or a professional has the right, the same right as the patient to either see um, I've worked with a, uh, I've worked with a physician that doesn't prescribe birth control because she's Catholic, which was fine. She has that right. So she saw no patients and or women that were on birth control. The office was fine with that. I won't say the office name, but what I'm saying is that the patient and the provider both have that same right. However, I do agree with Amira that just because she's Catholic, she cannot bring that she which I think what she's trying to say is that you don't want to make that the theme of your practice is that what you're All saying right, now hold on Ashley hold on Ashley so now Ashley's position is um and you give the example of a of a physician who doesn't want to prescribe birth control which, right by right. the way is a legal right that women have and yeah. so now so now the doctor says I don't prescribe birth control so I don't want to see any patients who might need birth control or want birth control. And Ashley goes so far as to say that if that is the worldview of the physician, the physician has every right 
to um, incorporate that into her practice and not prescribe birth control. So Ashley also, I assume, is perfectly comfortable if me as if I as a physician say, um, I don't like Muslims and uh, therefore I just don't want Muslims in my caseload. And don't even get me started about black people. Like, you, no, no, you cannot trust African-Americans. They lie to you. They're doctor shopping all the time because they're all a bunch of drug addicts. And I don't want to prescribe anything to, to, in fact, I want an all white practice. And it's not because I'm a racist. I'm not a racist. I just feel that's just my worldview. And Ashley says that I get to incorporate my worldview into my practice. Ashley, yes or no? I see where you're going. And that, I mean, that brings up a good, I mean, it really does. It's, it's a really good case there. I mean, but, and she, and, and I was her medical assistant at the time and I was fine with it, but that's just because I was doing my job. But, um, I also felt bad for the girls that were coming in and had no idea that she didn't prescribe. And I'm like, well, you definitely Ooh. want it. You should get it. All right. <laughs> but, ask Ashley, you just put your finger on something really, really, really important here, okay? And that little tidbit of information gives me what I need to make an ethical analysis of that situation. Let's go back to the case I presented to you about the mental health counselor, by the way, in a publicly supported public dollars mental health setting who said, I want a straight only caseload, okay? Here's what we said. No, <laughs> we said, first of all, and, and Amira, you're gonna love the argument. We said, as a public agency, we do not discriminate on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. We don't even know how we could guarantee you a straight only caseload. What are we supposed to do? Ask everybody when they come in and screen patients on the basis of their professed sexual orientation? And what about people who are having um, gender dysphoria issues or you know, who want to explore these feelings because, because they're not really sure? Think about an adolescent individual. You're telling me you, you can't even go there. What we said was, if you can't do that, you can't meet the standard of practice that we have set for our providers which means you are, failing, you are failing to meet the standard of care. So the answer is no. However, this is what we said. This is what we said. We will take this individual client off your caseload now because you have revealed to us a deficit in your ability to meet this person's needs. If you're going in there with, with that strong and emotional set, right? then we, I can't possibly imagine that you're going to be a caring professional who gives this person what he needs. So we're taking this guy off your caseload. No, that's not what you were trying to say, Amira. No, it was not. Because this is what we said. We will take this one guy off your caseload, not because we are respecting your personal values, but rather because we believe you are incapable of meeting his clinical needs. So you get this guy off your caseload. However, however, we now need to match, we need to send you back to school, or we need to match you up with a mentor, or we need to come up with a performance improvement program. You need to recognize that your inability to deal with these issues constitutes a deficit. And you need to rectify that. You need to remediate the deficit. That's when the counselor said, you don't get it. It isn't a deficit. Um, I don't want to be taught how to provide value neutral uh, mental health counseling to individuals when they start talking about their sexual orientations. So um, I don't want to be fixed. I don't want, I don't, you know, I, no. And that's when we said, um, then you can't work here because we believe that it's inconsistent with the standard of care and that you're not being a good uh, mental health counselor. What we then went on to say was, and Ashley, this is where it becomes important. If you go hang up your shingle somewhere and you advertise yourself as a Christian counseling center and you make it clear, it's written on the door. We don't talk about X, Y, and Z. 
there could be patients out there who actually want a setting like that. They understand the ground rules and, and that's what they want. Okay, go into private practice, but be honest about who you are and what you are, but you cannot work here because we will not support that kind of discrimination. What Ashley said that scares the bejeebies out of me is that apparently young women were going into that office not knowing that certain options that could be clinically indicated and legal for them to receive wouldn't even be offered. Now that's dishonest. And I think that I don't care how Catholic you are, that doctor had a responsibility to put in big bold print on the door to her office, I am a Catholic physician, I do not do birth control. If you think that that might be something you need to talk about, find another doctor. And in fact, Ashley, I even think that the doctor would be wrong even if she did that because she might have an adolescent patient who came into her practice not knowing that this was gonna be an issue. Later, it becomes an issue. Now she may, needs to make a decision about whether or not she wants birth control and this doctor won't counsel her about that. I think that that doctor would have a responsibility at that point to actually say, I don't think I can do a good, now, now Amira, maybe this is where your argument comes back. I honestly don't think I can provide you with the quality services you need because based on my religious view, I'd, I would have trouble recommending birth control, but I need to refer you to a doctor who will prescribe you with birth control. I don't even think it's enough for the doctor to say, I don't do that. If you want that, go find someone else. That patient may not have the wherewithal to find someone else. I think that doctor actually has an affirmative obligation to say, I can't do it, but I will hook you up with a doctor who will. I got to hear that. Or else, Ashley, I think that doctor was not acting ethically as a physician. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, she it was it was really hard working for her. But <laughs> when it, you, you're first out of medical assisting school, you're like, you kind of just keep you know, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't like it. <laughs> now the hard, the real hard cases here are going to be the reverse. You know, it's one thing when the doctor says, or the provider could be a nurse, could be mental health, could be whatever says, I can't work with Muslims. I can't work with gay people. I can't work with racial minorities. I can't work with, you know, whatever. But what if it goes the other way? And, and I've gotten this ethics case consult too, where the patient says, um, are you a Christian? because I need, I need to know that I can pray with my provider. Or what if they don't even ask that? Here, here's a situation you might very well find yourself in as a nurse, where a patient is scared and, and is worried, maybe getting ready for surgery or, or just really heading downhill and, and, is, and is just freaking out and says, and, and reaches up and grabs your hand and says, Will you pray with me? Um, well, okay. What do you do then? I mean, do you disclose? Uh, well, I can hold your hand while you pray, but like, I'm not one of you, so I'm not going to say amen. Do you just say amen? Do you pretend? Um, you know, what, what do you do at that point? And, and ideally, you'd say, if you need some chaplaincy support, let me, let me get the, the, pat, you know, the, the hospital chaplain in to give you that support. But sometimes it happens too quick. Um, and I've had patients who have said, I need a Christian. I've, I've had patients say, um, I, I mean, I hate to keep going to race, and I'm sorry if it sounds offensive, especially on a day when the Chauvin trial is coming to an end. But I've had, I've had, I've heard patients that said, I, you know, I, I want a white uh, provider. I've uh, that too. Yeah. Okay. So, but we're an equal opportunity employer. And, and what, so what are we going to do with that? Now, it's interesting that if a woman says, I want a female gynecologist, we have no trouble with that. But 
if someone says, well, I need a Christian or I need someone who, you know, whose race matches mine or whatever, well, now that, that doesn't feel right. Um, these, these are complex issues, very, very complex issues. Um, but I have been in a position where we have told patients, actually it was in long-term care, where a woman was just saying terribly racist things. And we basically told her, you either cut it out or we're gonna evict you. We're gonna, we're gonna kick you out of the community. You can't live here and mistreat staff. We, staff have a right not to live or not to work in a threatening work environment and you are making this a threatening environment. So this is a hostile work environment because of you. We need to protect our staff from your kind of just racist yuck. Of course, if you were a nice sweet person until the dementia set in, and now you start saying racist stuff, you know, secondary to your dementia, all of a sudden staff are like, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't kick her out. So it gets, it gets complicated. It gets very, very complicated. Um, li listen, we're gonna run out of time. We, have, we didn't get to anything we were gonna talk about. I'll tell you one story. Two stories, two stories. One is personal and then the other one, not so much. So I live in Lynchburg, Virginia and Lynchburg, Virginia has a reputation for being a pretty conservative, um, pretty conservative evangelical kind of town. I'm not, by the way, uh, for full disclosure, I'm Jewish. And amazingly, by the way, I was the mayor of the city for four years. I was on city council for 12 years. So Lynchburg, Virginia had a Jewish mayor. What do you know? But when we first moved to town, um, well, a couple of years after we moved to town, my wife got pregnant with our second child and we went shopping for a doctor and we went into the doctor's office. And I said, um, listen, if, if something goes wrong with this, with this uh, pregnancy, and I don't expect it to happen, I'm not paranoid, but you know, if, if we got into a situation where the baby's in distress, my wife is in distress, you need to make a decision and the treatment modality that you select is either going to benefit the baby or the mother. So you, let's say you can save one at the cost of the other. Do you have any idea about what you would do? And the doctor said, oh, that, that'll never happen. Don't worry about it. Don't, you're being silly. Just don't worry. And I said, look, I, I'm not worried and I'm not really agitated about this, but I just was wondering, do you have any preconceived notions? I mean, if my wife's life and my baby's life are, are pitted against each other, do you have any, do you have a plan in place? And you know what I was fishing for, right? I mean, you know, the Catholic church um, does, does, not say, does not allow you to, to save the mother if it means intentionally destroying the fetus, okay? In the Jewish religion, if the two come into conflict, you prefer the mother, okay? It's a difference of opinion. What the doctor said was, he thought about it, because I asked now twice, and he leaned back in his chair and he sort of thought about it, and he said, I can't even imagine a scenario where you'd have to make that decision. And I said, well, I can't even imagine that you're gonna be our doctor. <laughs> That's it, we're out of here. I wasn't looking to see what the doctor, that the, in fact, if the doctor said, oh, I'd save the mother or, oh, I'd save the child, that's a dangerous answer. What I was fishing for was the doctor to say, well, obviously you've thought about this. You know, you must have some values. So um, what, what, what do you think we ought to do? And then, Amira, I would go with your argument, which is if I say something so radically contradictory to what the doctor feels comfortable with, at that point, I'd expect the doctor to say, wow, well, I really respect your view, but I'm afraid I might not be the right doctor for you. Let's help you find someone who could meet your needs. But he couldn't even imagine it. And so bye-bye. Now, I tell you that story, which is a personal story to lead up to this next story. I got an ethics consult um, from an OB in town who called me and said, here's the situation. We've got a 26-week AGA pregnancy here. Um, so, you know, 26 out of 40. Babies are pretty good size at that point. However, it's twins. And so they're pretty low birth weight. And one of them, membranes ruptured several days ago, almost a week ago. So we have a smaller baby without amniotic fluid. 
And then we have a bigger baby who's healthy. Here's the problem. And this is the ethics consult. And I know you got to leave, so I'm going to let you go in a second. Um, a week ago, two weeks ago, if, if baby went into, went into distress, we would not do a C-section because that baby's going to die no matter what we do. And the C-section would do nothing but introduce iatrogenic risk to the healthier baby. So two weeks ago, this is not an ethical problem. If baby one goes into distress, we're letting it go. Two weeks from now, week from now, two weeks from now, if baby one goes into distress, we're going to do a C-section because by then baby two is big enough that it's not ideal, but we think we can really protect baby two's interests. And the only way to save baby one would be an emergency C-section. So two weeks ago, no ethical problem. Two weeks from now, no ethical problem. But right now, if baby one goes into distress, the only way to possibly save it is with the C-section. And a C-section is likely to introduce significant risk of harm to baby two. So right now, if, 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 if baby one goes into distress, what should we do? Save baby one or save baby two? This is actually a really good case to end on because it brings back in what I, what I talked about before about disaster ethics. You can't save both. Whatever you do, you're going you're gonna, to, one baby's probably going to die or be severely lifelong damaged. What should we do if, if baby goes into distress now? I went up to the unit thinking this was going to be an allocation of scarce resources issue that it was gonna be, gee, we have to decide, should we save baby one or should we save baby two because we know we can't save both. Tough case. When I got to the unit, I realized it had nothing to do with allocation of scarce resources. The reason I got consulted was that a nurse walked into the patient's room and said, and this is about as close to a quote as I can get, said to the patient, you realize if your baby goes into distress and you don't do anything you can do to save it, you'll be a murderer. Yeah. Um, that nurse had some pretty strong personal values. This ethics consult quickly transformed from allocation of scarce resources. If you can't save both, what ought you to do to a nurse not understanding the limits of her role. The real answer to this question is what does the pregnant woman want? And we need to give her all the information so that she can make a choice. But frankly, I don't care if you're pro-choice and I don't care if you're pro-life. Neither of those positions tells you what to do. If you're radically pro-choice and you think both these fetuses are full-fledged people with full rights, you still don't know which one to save if you can't save both. If you're radically pro-choice and you think, no, no, fetuses are not full-fledged, it still doesn't tell you what to do in this case. This is, this is a case where we have to say, as the doctor could not tell me when we were shopping for our own OB, we need to inform the mother about the alternatives, risks, and benefits and ask her if we have to make a choice, what would you want us to do? And yet that nurse couldn't see it. She believed that her religious view was ironclad and that she got to impress that upon the patient. And I think Amira would say, hell no. And I think Amira would also say, we got to have a little conversation with this nurse and tell her this is a deficit. I'm taking you off this case because you obviously don't know how to be sympathetic to this woman who's in a very difficult spot right now. And you better learn how to overcome this deficit. And we will send you to school. We will set you up with a mentor, but you need to learn the lesson. And if you're not able or willing to learn that lesson, you are not fit to be a nurse in our hospital and you're fired. Well, this has been an interesting conversation that did not go in the direction we anticipated, but I hope that you've had fun anyway. And uh, if you all want to chat some more, I'd be happy to set up another session. But Maris, I am going to um, mute myself and tell you all, thank you so much for being um, willing to go into a field that demands so much of you, especially in these very, very difficult circumstances. Um, stay healthy. Um, and, um, and if I can ever help any of you process an ethical issue in the future, drop me an email. So Maris, it's all you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Gillette. This was awesome. I appreciate your time and willingness to talk to us. Um, if you have not already put your name and D number in the chat, if you are trying to get a Chamberlain point, please do that. Otherwise, I already have it. Um, thank you guys very much. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording.